Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the third chapter. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Lord. Then Jesus went home, and the crowds gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of men and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit it never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's pray. Father, remind us of who you are and not who we want you to be. Remind us of what you've called us to be and not what we would prefer to be. Remind us of what you have done for us so that we realize we can do nothing but trust in you. Remind us, Lord, because we are all too often forgetful of you. We are all too often caught up in too many other things and our hearts become cold and indifferent. Remind us so that each day we know to whom we belong, who has created and who has redeemed us. Now, Lord, gather us around your word. Help us to hear it, and in hearing it, help us to live. We ask and pray these things in your name. Amen. Good friends, grace and peace to you today from God our Father and through our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Surprisingly, I've only ever had two or three people come to me over the years and ask me what the unforgivable sin is. One of them actually believed that they had committed it and they wanted to make, find out if they were doomed forever. Um, the others were just curious. I'm not going to preach on that text, but I'm going to tell you what it is so we can move on to something else. The, unforgi the unforgivable sin that Jesus is talking about is what the scribes were accusing him of. That he was doing all of the things that he was doing, not because he was from God, but because he was from the devil. And so to say that Jesus is doing something that is not godly or to claim that Jesus is in league with Satan is, according to Jesus, unforgivable because it's flat out rejecting Jesus as the Son of God. It's flat out rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. And anyone who refuses to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, who refuses to believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, can't be forgiven. It's as simple as that. But I do want to talk about sin today. We Christians, and especially we Lutherans, are big on sin, at least big on talking about it. It's not that we have an obsession with sin, but sin is at the heart of what it is to be human. And so we pay a great deal of attention to it. Not that I'm sitting in my study day by day and recording the sins of my parishioners as they come to mind, because who has that kind of time? Of course, you could say the same thing of me. You know, if we sat down and wrote all Pastor Hatcher's sins, boy, you'd fill up volumes. He did it again, he did that, he did, you know, but we don't want to talk about that because that's the wrong way of thinking about sin. It's not keeping score of what somebody else is doing or not doing. Sin is about what's happening between me and God. As like I tell the confirmands and confirmation, sin is anything that gets between your relationship with God and yourself and with your neighbor. 
And we need to begin thinking about that because God thinks about it. God looks at us and he sees us as we are. He sees us for who and what we are. He sees the person that we let everybody else see. And he sees the person that we let no one see. He sees it all. And of course the anxiety we have with that is we worry that if God sees our sin as clearly as he does, and trust me he does, that he can't be pleased with us. That it's got to irritate him. It might even make him angry with us because we seem to persist in sin. And the truth of the matter is we do. Paul says that in Romans. He says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He tries to be a believer and to leave sin behind in his life. He says, but the good that I would do, I don't do. And the very thing that I don't want to do, that's what I wind up doing. Paul's describing the human situation. And it's very easy for us to think that when God is looking at us and looking at our sin, that he's got to be at least frustrated and probably downright angry. And unfortunately we tend to read scripture that way when we read about God and how he relates to sinful human beings. We get this sense that God is always angry. Now I'm not saying that there aren't times in scripture where God is clearly angry. I mean you're not in any doubt in some of those passages that God is upset. But I don't think that justifies reading every passage where God confronts sinners as God being angry. I always used to think about that when I was reading this passage from Genesis, that here God is, he's given him this beautiful creation and said, it's all yours, just this one little spot over here, don't touch it, that's where God is God and you're not. And of course, like a two-year-old, what's the first thing they do? They're over to the tree having lunch. And then they realize that they're cut off from God. That's what they're realizing they were naked meant. It realized that the relationship between themselves and God which absorbed their whole beings was now gone. And so they were hiding. And that's where our text comes today. And I always used to think that God was, was strolling through the garden with kind of a bit of a fume going on and getting angrier and angrier with Adam and Eve until an Orthodox priest told me, you're reading the story all wrong. And he said, think about this. Why would God need to go for a stroll in the garden in the cool of the day? God is an eternal being. He is not like us, physical in the way that you and I are. He has no need for going for a walk in the garden. He goes into the garden so that Adam and Eve who are hiding can know that he's there. He's giving them the opportunity to come to him and say, Lord, we did what you commanded us not to do. Rather than pouncing on them like a wild animal, God comes to them in mercy and grace and gives them his presence so that they can come to him and confess and be forgiven. But instead of coming out of hiding, they stay hiding in the bushes as if God doesn't know where they are. If God is the eternal all-knowing being that we say that he is, he knows full well where Adam and Eve are hiding. He has no illusions about where they might be. And yet he doesn't go over to their hiding spot and rip the bushes away and say, aha, I caught you. Rather, he calls out to them. Not in anger and in vindictiveness, but like a loving parent might call for the child, where are you? 
Even though God knows where they are, he calls out to them to give them in mercy and in grace yet again an opportunity to come out of hiding and to say, Lord, we did that which you commanded us not to do. Well, they do respond. They do come out of hiding. At least Adam does. I assume Eve does too. And he comes out and he starts making excuses. I heard you walking in the garden and I was afraid. What reason did Adam have to be afraid? Had God ever shown him wrath or anger or judgment or condemnation before this? All he had ever seen of God was a loving, creating father who not only called the whole universe into existence, but gives the whole earth to Adam and to Eve to have and to care for. Why would he be afraid of God? Well, of course, this is what his newfound divine insight has given him. When we grasp at God, we realize first and foremost we are not God. And Adam is beginning to realize that he's torn the relationship between himself and God. But all he can say is, I was naked and I hid myself. I was so afraid of you, God. I was so afraid of you, Lord. I was so afraid of what you might do. Because like human beings, when we are wronged, one of our first impulses is to get back at the person who's wronged us. We may get over it right away, but that's one of our first impulses. Our brain starts thinking, how can I get even? How can I show them? And that's what human thinking does. But God the Father again, instead of jumping all over this admission of Adam's, asks again. And listen to the voice, not with a voice of anger, but with a voice of compassion and love, giving them yet again an opportunity to confess and to say to God the truth that they both know. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the fruit of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Again, mercy and grace giving Adam the opportunity to say to God the Father, yes, yes, that's true. I did that. I disobeyed you. I rebelled against you. I reached my hand out to grasp what it was to be God and fell far short of it. Father, Father, forgive me. Because in his mercy and his grace, God is giving Adam yet another chance. To speak the truth. And of course, does Adam rise to that occasion? Does Adam turn to the Father and confess and repent in tears, weeping at the feet of the Lord? No, he does what is the one of the most human things to do. He starts blaming everybody and everything but himself. That woman, Lord, you know, the one you made and gave me, if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't be in this mess. Someone once said to err is human, to blame somebody else for it is human still. The truth of the matter is we don't want to be honest about our sin. We always want to explain it, to justify it, to say, well, if you'd understand the circumstances, Lord, you would have done the same thing. Well, guess what, folks? God understands the circumstances. And yet Adam throws away another chance to simply say, I'm sorry. And yet God's mercy and grace continues because he speaks to the woman, what have you done? And the woman too, Eve's too. The snake deceived me. At least she was truthful. I was deceived and I ate. But in none of this has anyone said, Father, I'm sorry. 
I don't deserve the grace and the patience and the mercy that you've been showing me, but I am so sorry for what I've done. Well, someone would come on and say, well, God punishes them. And it's true, life gets very hard for the human beings after that. But it's more that God allows the consequences of what they've done to play out in their lives. Because God does that. He gives us the freedom to be human beings. Even to the point of telling him, I don't want you in my life. I want to call the shots. God is willing to let us even say that. But he is also going to let us live with where that takes us. And hopefully, hopefully, that will take us to the point where the psalmist speaks in today's psalms. If, Lord, you should count our sins, if you should mark down the things we have done, or failed to do, or thought, or said, who among us could stand? Who among us would be insane enough on the last day to go before God, the eternal creator of the entire universe, and say to him, open the book of life and I'll show you what a great life I've lived. You've got to let me into heaven. If you want a definition of madness, that's it. To believe that we can demand of God what we both know can't happen. Who can stand if God marks the sins? But there is forgiveness with you. There is mercy and there is grace. There is compassion and charity unending because the end of our, gospel, our lesson today from the Old Testament is the passage where the God says to Adam and Eve and to the serpent, you will bruise his heel, a descendant of Eve, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. I like the Hebrew word there much better than bruise. It means to literally crush the life out of it. A descendant of Eve and Adam will crush the head of the serpent, will crush the power of sin and death. Yes, the serpent, the evil one, will bruise him and wound him and nail him to a cross, but he, by his dying and rising, will shatter the power of sin and death forever. For the mercy and the grace of God will not let sin stand. It will not let the consequence of sin stand. It will not allow death to hold the whole human race enthralled and enslaved. God seeks to free each and every one of us as he sought so lovingly, so gently, so compassionately in the garden to call Adam and Eve out of their sin. He does that for you and I day in and day out. God does not want to be wrathful with us. God does not want to let his anger boil over against us. Rather, God the Father wants to show us our folly and our sin so that we can be restored to him. So that we can know that there is nothing, nothing that will stand between him and us. The death and the resurrection of Jesus has shattered all the barriers. And only if we willfully construct them ourselves, they will never, ever stand between us and the Father who loves us. So yes, we talk about sin. So we can be truthful about it. So we can be honest with ourselves. So that we can say with that tax collector in the parable of Jesus who couldn't lift his eyes to heaven, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, so that we can speak the truth, not so that God can judge and condemn, but so that God can forgive and set us free. For that is his heart's desire. 
That is why he has given his son to suffer and die for the whole world. That is why he has poured the Holy Spirit into our hearts so that we can not only hear that word of mercy and forgiveness, but thanks be to God, we can believe that it's true for me as it is for you. So yes, we talk about the difficult things, but we talk about them so that we can come to the merciful God whose love and purpose is to redeem us and bring us into the kingdom. So it may sound strange, but it is true. Joyfully confess your sins to the Father. Be glad that you can repent, for it is his love and it is mercy to forgive. To forgive all those who repent, all those who confess, all those who come to him and say, only by your grace and your love do I belong to you at all. And thanks be to God that we do. Amen.